Good evening and welcome to another edition of Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Derbyologist, and joining me again this week is Capping with Candice, Candice Hare. It's Belmont Stakes Week, Candice. We had a couple of weeks off since the Preakness and kind of a new Super Saturday type format this year with a, a full card of stakes races. And let's kind of dive right into the, the grade one action, the meat of the schedule in the middle of the lineup. And uh, the fifth, a highly anticipated race with some older fillies and mares. Yeah, it might be a short field, but this is a really great race. We get Beholder, Princess of Silmar, and Close Hatches highlighting the action here. Um, of course, Princess of Silmar kind of dominated uh, the, kind of the mid part of last year after she won the Kentucky Oaks, and Beholder kind of put her foot down at Santa Anita to win the Bist House to finish off the year. Um, for me, I, I do think that Princess of Silmar will ultimately go off being favored, being that the race is up in New York, but my choice here is Beholder. I just think, you know, ultimately she really is the best of this bunch. And I know people tend to knock her because her biggest wins have come over in California only. But, you know, when she did ship to Churchill for the Kentucky Oaks, she finished second. She didn't flop here. So I do think that she has the ability to travel and still perform well. I mean, there isn't much to go off of with her one start this year because it just wasn't against anywhere near this type of quality. Um, she would go out and win easy, but... I just think ultimately she's kind of the fastest of this bunch, and by all accounts, by everything I've heard and seen of her on track, she's looked well, looks like she shipped well, so for me, it's, it's Beholder. You know, the big three in this race, Close Hatches, Princess of Silmar, and Beholder, uh, I'm leaning towards what you're thinking. I think Princess of Silmar is going to get bet down to the favorite, um, barely, probably, I'm thinking seven to five, eight to five. Uh, then I think Beholder will be the second favorite in closed hatches. Uh, I'm going with Beholder. I just, you know, I, I think sometimes when you really, this isn't like a, the Belmont Stakes or even the Derby win. You're not really sure who's going to win. You, you kind of have to start. I mean, one of these three horses will win this race. And so I think it gets you right down to the contenders. And Beholder is, you know, she ran the, the fastest fractions and held on to the fate, uh, pace last year in the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, Richard Mandela is actually one of the best trainers out there and pointing for a race. Um, I think that they're going to New York. I mean, this will erase all doubts. They beat Princess of Silmar in New York. It's game over, case closed for the year. They are, I mean, unless something dramatically goes wrong, it's going to force, at a minimum, Princess of Silmar to come west to try to get the title from her. Um, on the other hand, if Princess of Silmar wins, I think she gets the upper hand and and close hatches last year was kind of a step behind these two horses. Um, but I do think you saw in Breeders' Cup Day that uh, she had kind of closed that gap. And she also has two races this year. I mean, logically, uh, close hatches is probably the overlay of the three. And, and I would say it's Beholder and, and close hatches in the order that I rank them. So anything else pace-wise that you're going to kind of be looking at? Or what's kind of the, the tail of the tape for you? Not really. I mean, I just think it's pretty straightforward. Like you said, I think, you know, it's only field of five, and you have those three, so it's almost kind of a match race, but between three of them. So, you know, I, I don't... I think the holder will sit just off the pace, off of close hatches pace, but, you know, it. I I don't think that anything crazy or out of the ordinary is going to happen from a pace perspective. Uh, we've got the Met Mile and a, a, a large field. I mean, I was expecting a big field, but... Sometimes you never know who's going to pass through the entry gate. They upped the purse this year, and kind of some familiar names uh, from last year on the Derby Trail, and then some hard-hitting six and seven furlong horses are kind of stretching out to a mile. And the mile is usually one of those races that uh, ends up being kind of an exciting race. Some years you have a, a, a speedball take it, and then you know last year we had a come-from-behind closer win at the final stride. Yeah, I think this is a really exciting race, and I think there's so many storylines coming in here, having, you know, maybe Talos Malice, who a lot of people think is the best horse in training right now, having drawn the rail, which is far from ideal, I think, for him. You have Golden Suns coming in with our British Cup Mile, uh, Dirt Mile champion, and he's coming off the layoff, so it's the first time we'll see him all year long. Plenty of horses we've seen throughout the year. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards a couple on the outside. Um, I, I like Romanche. I think that he'll, you know, be able to stop the pace. I do expect the pace to be quite fast here with Golden Sense in the field and Moreno and Broadway Empire and Palace Mills might even have to be sent 
from the rail as well. So I do expect this to be fast. Um, and Romash is a horse who he doesn't always, he's not the most consistent. He definitely throws in his clunkers here and there. But he will be off the pace. And he is a horse who I, I do think he could relish this cutback. He's been running much further than this recently, going well in eighth most often, well in a quarter. So I do think he'll relish being, you know, cutting back to the mile. And um, he, he did have a nice race last out. Um, at Aqueduct. So, you know, he's one who I'm leaning towards. The other one who I quite like is shaking it up. And for both these guys, I mean, the post positions aren't ideal. I was a little bit disappointed after the draw, but shaking it up is a horse who really seems to have come into his own lately. Um, you know, he's won a few times at Santa Anita to start the year, and, you know, he's most recently ran second to Central Baker, um, only losing by head over at Churchill, so it does seem like he can travel and still you know, run honest races. I thought that he ran a pretty nice race there, closing from the back. So, you know, he's another one who he'll be, you know, definitely off the pace. And like I said, I do expect the pace to be more than healthy here. So, you know, shaking it up, Romage, clearly now is a horse who I've been on him every time he's ran this year, and he's been his third both times. I expect him to make a step forward here. He's had a couple of tough trips in both of those, you know, those excuses for... You know, his third place finishes, um, considering the trips that he's had, he's been, he was steadied in his first start, and the second start he had a very, very wide trip, and still only finished uh, one and three quarters lengths behind Central Banker and Shaking It Up, who were, you know, very close up front, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leaning those three, clearly now Romain's Shaking It Up, um, I mean, as far as the others, Golden Sense would not surprise me in the slightest if he won, I'm a little bit leery off the layoff, but he, he wouldn't surprise me by any means. Um, Palace Malice, I mean, I'm a big fan of this horse. I, was, you know, I think anyone who follows me knows that much. I just, I couldn't have him here at this price. I couldn't have him at this post. He is more than capable of winning, but I just think he's kind of been overhyped considering what he's beaten this year. You know, he won, at, he's, he has won at a one turn mile, so, you know, people maybe are playing up, you know, his inability to do that a little bit much, but, um, you know, he beat Golden Ticket by head. His win over Normandy Invasion down in New Orleans was really nice. But other than that, I mean, he's just beaten horses that, you know, are I mean, more than a cut below this bunch. So I, I couldn't have him at what will surely be odds on uh, price. So, you know, for me, I'm leaning more towards Romance shaking it up clearly now. Palace Mouse wouldn't surprise me, but I just don't think there's any value there. Yeah, I think it's a very tough race because you've got, I mean, you know you're going to get the fast pace. It, it, it doesn't really even matter who sets it at this point. It could be mm -hmm. Broadway Empire. It could be Golden Sense. Um, in races like this, when I have four or five contenders, um, I try to just pick the best horse. Um, I firmly believe Golden Sense is a very, very good horse, and I'm looking forward to this horse running a couple of nine furlong races this year. Um, I, I, I basically circled this Met Mile way back in January. He hasn't missed a beat. Um, I mean, a seven furlong workout a couple of weeks ago in 121 just kind of knocked the, the knocks right out of the past performances at me. Um, it's not ideal. I, it's very rare that a horse can win off the layoff. Um, I'm still picking Golden Sense just because, like I say, I'm just going to pick the best horse. Um, I agree with you. I think probably there's no other horse in America that is in more stable males than clearly now. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me to see him run a good one. And he's one of those horses that is eventually going to get a win. And it could be Saturday, or it could be the Forgo, or it could be the Tom Fool. It's, it's going to be a race, and he's probably going to be about 6 or 7 to 1, and everybody's going to talk about all of his tough trips. And that's just kind of the way a horse like that goes. Um, shaking it up is very capable. I mean, he, he fits the pace profile. So I guess if I had to do backup tickets, I would do him. Uh, Palace Malice. And Normandy Invasion, I mean, Palace clearly beat Normandy Invasion the last time. Then Normandy missed his race. Then they pointed for the Met Mile. I'm never a big plan once the plans change, so it's kind of weird. I mean, Palace Malice, to me, is just not a true miler. Plus, he's already had three races. And I think he's kind of due for a little bit of a regression. So I guess if I had to go three of them, I'd probably go Golden Sense, uh, Normandy Invasion, and Shaking It Up. But... Clearly now is capable, and, and Central Banker loves seven furlongs. It's just a question whether he can get a mile. 
but I, I, I mean, a lot of times this race has been hyped up for quite a while, and all the main contenders really made it to the big dance here on Saturday. Yeah, it's kind of rare, and I used to seeing that, but, you know, I definitely think that this is a race where, you know, it's kind of ironic, because I think a lot of people were really planning on just singling Palace Malice, and then when he drew the rail, you're not hearing so much of that talk anymore. Um, I really think this is a race where you're, you're going to want to spread if you can, for sure. Yeah, and I think a lot of people weren't expecting the quality of horses to show up. I think they thought it was going to be Palace. I mean, they, they were hearing the big names, and I think they thought it would be a six-horse field. And it ended up being, I mean, these other horses are going to clog up some space and they are going to add to the pace. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can get some weird results. I mean, uh, I mean, I think it would be huge. If Palace Malice were to win, um, it would definitely dictate the rest of what he does the rest of the summer. I think, you know, Golden Sense, win or lose, he's still got a nice four or five race campaign ahead of him. But if Palace Malice were to win this, I mean, they would just probably run once or twice more, wrap up older horse of the year, and, and not have to run in the Breeders' Cup. But uh, So that's kind of what I'm looking at in terms of, you know, I think it's a lot like the Phillies, where I think if Princess of Silmar wins, she's not going to go to the West Coast this year. Uh, if the holder beats her, then, you know, I think she's got a line on older Philly, and, and Close Hatches has already got two races, so if she wins, then, you know, she gets that third win, and that's a pretty big threesome for her. So... I'm looking forward to the race. I mean, I think this is one of those races that you're going to see fast fractions. You're going to see a fast final time. But I'm a firm believer that usually races like this, class wins out. And, you know, a horse like Broadway Empire and some of these other horses, they're not winning. But they will contribute to the madness. They will contribute to the pace meltdown. Um, but at the end of the day, your, your top four or five contenders are going to be pretty much in the top four or five slots. You might just shake them around a little bit. So. It's a big race for Palace Malice, and it does uh, prove a lot if he can win at a mile just for, um, you know, being four wins in a row. And I think for Normandy Invasion, a lot for him to prove. If he wins, you know, this horse has been kind of hyped up a lot, and he's probably the most hyped up horse with two lifetime wins of anybody. I mean, I'm not surely, really sure where Normandy Invasion fits. Is he a miler, or can he go a mile? Yeah, I mean, I'm inclined think that maybe he gets better at a mile, but you're kind of right. He's, you know, he, it's really hard to see where he fits. I mean, does he fit, you know, more with, you know, this kind of the Golden Sense, Morenos, that kind of group, or does he fit more with, you know, Palace Malice and Revolutionary and that bunch? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm kind of inclined to think he'll prefer the shorter distance, maybe, you know, horse who will relish one turn mile, but I, I mean, I'm sure a race like this will tell us a lot. What about a horse like Marino? I mean, he was bet down a couple of times in a row, and then now he ends up with some heavy hitters, but he cuts back in distance, too. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the cutback will definitely suit him. The talent is there. I mean, there's he's had a few races now. He had, you know, had a couple last year with Olympic Charge, and then um, two back uh, at Charlestown, where he, you know, he's definitely shown talent, and he's just shown raw speed, but... You know, he's just not quite able to cut it with, you know, the big voice of this older male division. I do think he'll like the cutback, but I'm not sure that he has as much capital speed as some of these other guys, and so the pace might really hinder him. We go to the turf now, the Manhattan, and this drew a full field, and it was kind of interesting. A few weeks ago, a few of these horses met in the Man of War, and now they come right back in this race. So it, it should be interesting to see how it develops this time. Last time it rained the day before. Um, this time it may be a little bit firmer course. Yay, I don't want any rain. Dry track. So everything I want to say is completely if, if it's firm turf. Um, you're right, and the Man of War last time out, the track was downgraded to good. I was there, and... I mean, of course, the turf course is inside the dirt course, so it wasn't like I was even right next to it, and I could totally see water on the grass. So it was absolutely wet. Um, imagining one that time um, under a very, very nice ride, I thought, from Joel Rosario. Um, he, there's going to be a, a bit more pace in here, though. I don't think he's going to be able to kind of walk the dog like he did there. Um, five irons here, Shemwa, Kai Gun, I would expect all of them to speak again, maybe even to be up near the front, and that should, you know, help out some of the deeper folders in here. Um, for me, I kind of said it on Twitter that this race 
for my multiple, you know, race wagers is the absolute key to me because I will be singling Grandeur here. Um, he'll be cutting back to about a quarter, which is much more up his alley. If the track is dry, that is absolutely what he wants as well. He would, would not want any moisture in the ground. And, it, you know, just at his best, he's flat out faster than these horses. He also will be first time Lasix, which is interesting because he has one over here. And, you know, he's a uh, two-time grade two winner over here and never used Lasix. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects him. And I do think that, you know, the added pace in this in this group is going to help him out quite a bit. Um, he was a little bit up against it with the slow fractions last time out. Um, so for me, it's, it's kind of all about grandeur here. I think this is his race to lose. And I think if he can't win this race over a dry course with Lasix, um, second time running in the U.S. now on this cycle, then maybe he's not as good as I think he is. But I think at his best, he's just, you know, flat out faster than this group. Um, as far as the others, I would say that, you know, since I'll be singling Grandeur, my biggest fear in here is Real Solution. Um, he's another one who will be closing from the back. And I thought he ran a very, very nice race last time out to get second to imagining he had a pretty wide trip and was fought pretty gamely to get up there and get second. So I, I have Grand for the win. Um, I am most worried about real solution, though, uh, as far as affecting my single. For me, it, it comes down to a couple of horses. I like real solutions and rookie sensation. Um, you know, you never want to be too confident in a pick, but every once in a while, you just the second a race is over, you just kind of go, ah, that horse really wasn't the best horse. And, I just had that feeling when the, the second imagining crossed the finish line the last time, I just knew they had everything his way. He had the soft going, Grandier didn't fire, Amira's Prince didn't fire, Real Solutions fired, but then he just kind of hung when he got even with him, and the fractions were slow, and it was a heady ride by Rosario, but it's like everything went in favor of uh, imagining that day. So for me, that's a horse that I won't be using in any of my tickets, mm -hmm. in first or second or pick threes or pick fours. Um, he's going to be underlaid. That doesn't mean he's not capable of winning. I just think in tune to the rest of the field, he's, he's just not as likely to win. Um, I do like real solutions just because he seemed to hung a little bit the last time. He was making a nice move. He really didn't like the off going, the softer footing. So I think he is rounding into his form cycle. Rookie Sensation has got some speed figures that you know, they fit with this group. And another horse I think a lot of people are liking is Seek Again. And I know that you're kind of familiar with Kaigan as well. So what about mm -hmm. Seek Again? Seek Again is really interesting because it seems like since he's, you know, he's one of these that since he's come over to the U.S., he's really kind of found his form. Um, he was okay over in England, nothing like super special, but he was fine. And then he's come out here and, you know, really kind of found his way getting Lasix and getting the firmer ground. Um, but you kind of have to take things into perspective. Like, it's, I think for him, it's kind of similar to Kaigan in that, you know, both of them are going to be underlays for quite some time because of their, you know, big races against Wise Dan. But at the same time, like, especially for Seekian even more so, like, why is Dan, I mean, consider all the things that went wrong with Wise Dan in that race, and he still won. So, I mean, sure, Sikian made it close, but obviously my Dan was much, much, much the best there. And I'm not saying we have a Wise Dan in this group by any means, but, you know, sometimes you need, you need to, like, watch the replays of those races instead of just seeing, like, oh, Wise Dan won by a head. Like, it was a lot more than that, considering all, I mean, it was trouble he caused himself, but all the trouble that he caused himself in there to still win. Um, so Seek Again is interesting in that he's, he's kind of found his way over here in the U.S., but um, I, I, I think he's a little bit of a cut below some of these. Uh, Kaigan, I, I do like him. I just wanted to get to drop back down in class. I, like, I, I kind of understood why they ran him in the grade one over at Keeneland, so it was a real short field. It's like, okay, well, give him the shot. He's been running well in the allowance races, but... Now I'm just like, okay, he's completely up against it here. I mean, I am a fan of this horse. I do think he's kind of as honest as they come, but I, I don't think he's a grade one horse by any means. Um, you know, for, for right now, I'd, I'd almost rather see him in, in allowance races and maybe eventually in a grade three or something. But I, I think he is up against it. 
in this group for sure. But I agree with everything you said about imagining earlier as well. He's a horror set. I mean, even if I wasn't singling or enter, I wouldn't use imagining anywhere. I do think he did have everything go his way last time. Well, let's go to the, the big race. Uh, triple crown on the line for the 12th time in, in 36 years. And, and, and since we last saw California Chrome uh, in a race, uh, we have survived a possum running out onto the track. And we've also survived nasal gate. It seems like it's been the longest three weeks of the summer already, and, and summer just started. Yeah, it's been, you know, one episode after another involving California Chrome, definitely what it seems like to this point. Um, you know, this is another one of the races. I think that, you know, on paper, he's the best in here. I don't think there's any doubt about that. It, but from a betting perspective, it's just going to be, you know, a matter of, are you going to take him and key him on top and just put some horses underneath, or are you going to try to beat him? And I mean, he's three to five morning line. He's probably going to give him maybe two to five or so with all the people buying souvenir tickets and, and such. So, you know, I have to bet against him on top. I, I just, I couldn't with a good conscience go in there and throw like a three to five shot on top. I have all the respect for him, and I do think he can win. And I'm not as put up by his post as so many people are. A lot of people made a big deal. This was a horrible draw for him. I don't see that at all. Um, you know, if anything, I kind of like it. It made it easier on us because I think it's clear he'll be up on the lead now. But I think, you know, that he'll be able to get on the lead and save ground, which is what he would want. I don't think there's anything wrong with it as far as he's concerned. But I'm looking at a couple horses here. Um, one I'm looking at is Metal Count. Uh, I think, I know you tweeted about him this week that, you know, people think he's kind of a synthetic specialist and that you don't necessarily agree with that. And, and I don't either. Uh, I, if you, you know, can go back to when we analyzed the Fountain of Youth after that was ran, he was a horse that I talked about quite a bit in there that I thought he ran a pretty good race in the Fountain of Youth, actually. You know, that, of course, was on the very speed bias track. The Wildcat Red and A-Rod kind of took off and said, you know, adios to everybody else. And it was kind of almost a couple races in one there. But I thought he ran an honest race there, and that was, of course, on the dirt at Goldstream. You know, he came back to win and then finished second both times at Keelan over the synthetic, but his derby was very, very nice. I mean, that is one where you cannot just look on paper, see that he finished eighth, and totally downgrade him for that. You need to watch the replay and see that he was absolutely making a run late. Well, him and Emma could strong where I think, and Danza just completely cut them both off. I mean, if it was any race but the derby, there's... There's no way Danza would have not been disqualified for what happened there. It was very abrupt, and you know, Metal Count did try to kind of regroup and come back and make another bid, but it was too late there. And he is one of these horses that, you know, as far as the pedigree is concerned, I'm not worried about this distance for him. And I probably can't say that about almost anybody else in this race. Maybe not even for anyone else in this race. So, you know, Metal Count is one I'm looking at. Um, I just think he's really live here, and he's going to be a nice price. Um, the logical play, if you're going against California Chrome, is wicked strong. Um, he, of course, had the 20 posts in the Derby. Still got up to finish fourth, despite you know an obviously a wide trip and dance and not really helping him out so much there. Um, you know, prior to that, he of course won the Wood, and you know now that we've gotten a few races now since these major preps, we can look back and see how that form has held, and the form of the Wood has held up. You know, I, I think the best of any of the major preps with uh, Wicked Strong and Samra, they finished fourth and fifth in the Derby, and then Social Inclusion came back to finish third in the Preakness. So I think the, the wood in particular is proven to be, you know, very strong um, of the major preps, so, you know, maybe that flatters him a little bit there, having won that race, and like I said, in the Derby, I just thought he ran a big race there, and there's no 20 post here, so, you know, he shouldn't have to uh, lose so much ground as he did there, and kind of weave around and get in between people. I think this is a horse who, you know, really will, will relish kind of running in a smaller field, seeing that he does come from off the pace a little bit here. So for me, those are kind of my top two choices. Um, others I'm considering, I do like Samrat. Um, I think he'll be a nice price. The distance is obviously a concern, but he's just kind of game. I think that he'll be, a, he'll be the horse who's kind of sits right off the of, California Chrome's flank, and he'll make that first move on him, and, you know, he's just all heart, Samrat is, and if the pace is really slow up front, which is what, you know, I expect, certainly there isn't 
you know, any real pace setter here, um, if California comes in the lead, I think he's going to want to slow it down. So if the pace is slow, I do give Sam Rutt more of a chance. I mean, there's questions about him with the distance, but at, at what I think will be a pretty big price, 20, 20 or 25 to 1, then, you know, I have no problem including him just for his toughness alone. And, you know, California Chrome's a horse who I think has shown that he's kind of intimidating when he makes that uh, move where he kind of accelerates away in a couple strides. I think he takes a lot of these horses off guard and uh, Sam Rutt, you know, went stride for stride for him uh, in the derby and just kind of flattened out and didn't have it late there. But at least he showed me some grit. He showed me that, you know, he wasn't intimidated by California Chrome by any means. So at a, you know, 20 to 1 plus, I would be fine with including him. Tonalist is a horse I like. I've gone really, really back and forth with him here. Um, and I still kind of don't know what I'm what, what I'm going to do with him, um, but he is one that we've talked about a lot, and I thought that, you know, that allowance optical claimer that he finished second in Constitution, of course, won, went on to win the Florida Derby. Wicked Strong finished fourth in there, went on to win the Wood. That's one that's run a really nice race in there to get second. He came back in the Peter Pan, and he won convincingly, but it was over sloppy track, and the Tappets do seem to like those sloppy tracks. Um, I mean, in fairness, Commissioner, who finished second by AP Indy, so certainly he probably liked the sloppy going as well. But you just don't often see horses, you know, who run big races over the sloppy tracks come back and run back to that. Um, there's been questions about his feet, that he's been wearing bar shoes. Um, his most recent work, I mean, there's strategy when they do these works, and his most recent work, he was sent off in front of his workmate. And that makes me think they're going to send him, and I'm not sure that's the best strategy for him in this race. So I'm a little, you know, kind of uneasy. I don't know what to make of him, even though he is a horse who I really, really liked coming into here. And, you know, a horse who I've liked for, you know, for quite some time now, but I just, I'm kind of leaning towards not having him here. I think I'm definitely going to have... Um, uh, Wicked Strong, and I'm definitely going to have Metal Count, and more, more than likely it'll be Samrot, but I'm leaning towards not, including Tonalist. Um, one who I will say is that's getting a lot of, you know, uh, airtime from people who don't, who aren't betting California Chrome is Commanding Curve, and I will say he is one who I won't include, and I can't, because the pace here is going to be pretty slow, and I think, you know, we're going to have kind of a bunched up pack and Commanding Curve just hasn't shown that he has the tactical speed of some of the others. You know, when he ran down in Louisiana and the Risen Star in Louisiana Derby, the paces of both those races early on were very slow, and he still found himself, you know, seven, eight lengths back early. And, I mean, I guess there's excuses for that maybe in the Louisiana Derby because he was bumped in the beginning by Rise Up. But, you know, just for him to keep finding himself so far back early, Behind these slow paces makes me think that, you know, what what's going to change? What's going to make him be closer up here? You know, it's so easy for people to say, like, well, he needs to run closer. But if he's never done that, you know, and just not even shown a propensity to do that at all, I don't know why I would think something's going to change here. Whereas, you know, my top two choices, Wicked Strong and Metal Count, they've both shown the ability, you know, when asked to get into a variety of positions, you know, depending on the pace of the race, they've shown the ability to do that and have that type of speed. So for me, my top choice is Wicked Strong. I think he's the logical play here. Metal Count's my second choice. I think he's very live at what will be a nice price. And I'll put Samra third. I um, just think he's a, kind of a gritty guy. Has a lot of heart, and he'll be another big price as well. For me, you know, I, I do want to talk about the race because I think, you know, sometimes, you know, you have all of these... Uh, speed handicappers and pace handicappers. But for me, it comes down to a lot of times in a race like this is gut instinct. And, and so just from your gut, who do you think is going to be leading at the six for long call? And who do you think is going to be leading at, as they come into the turn? I think Sam Rant is going to be leading at the six for long call. And I think California Chrome is going to be leading as they approach the turn. Who do you think is going to lead at those two spots? I think California Chrome's going to be leading at both of them. So then when you get down to you think California Chrome is going to be on the lead at the six furlong mark, 
let's assume the track was really fast last Sunday and Saturday for workouts. And I know it's supposed to rain on Thursday and Friday and it might tear up the track, but let's assume that it's, it's playing fast again and that anything slower than 113 and 2 is a slow fraction. Do you think they will go faster than 113 and 2 for six furlongs, or do you think they will go slower uh, slower than 113 and 2? I think they're going to go slower. And see, and that's, that's what I'm leaning towards, although it depends a little bit on how fast the track is playing on Saturday. So let's say maybe it, it slows down a little bit and, and 113.2 becomes 113 or something like that. So then I see kind of like the Derby, a bunched up field, and, and then you got Commanding Curve and the Pride of Ellis and, and Wicked Strong and Tonalist. I, I just think it does kind of set up for a different race for California Chrome. I, I firmly believe that if California Chrome just went out there, did 48, 112, 2, I think he would just win the race. Mm -hmm. I think if he loses the race, there's going to be all kinds of second guessing, and it's going to be because if he doesn't go to the lead, they're going to say he should have, and if he stays back, they're going to say, oh, they slowed down the pace too much and he waited too long. I guess I don't think he's in a win. I just think that he should go to the lead. I guess what, to me, it just, you know, people get this 12 furlongs in their head, and they just think, oh, I can't wire a mile and a half race, but that's just not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of can see what you're saying. I think that he's fast enough that if he just went out and ran his own race, that that would be it, that he would win it, and you know, maybe even pretty convincingly. But I kind of agree. I don't see that happening. I see him going up front, and I see him slowing it down. And in doing so, you, you bring a lot of these horses who maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to stay that far, you bring them into the race. Well, I always bring up the old, you know, it's the tortoise and the hare, and you probably remember that story. The mm -hmm. you, you let inferior horses stick around long enough, and one of them may just wake up. And you know, Wicked Strong is is coming into this race solid. Now, I would I'd have a heart. I mean, part of me really likes Sam Rand. I think he's gutsy, and I think he could be on the lead, and he could slow down the fractions. I like the fact that they keep on giving him long workouts. But 12 furlongs really isn't his ultimate game. Uh, I think Pride of Ellis, right on Curlin, is going to be challenged at 12 furlongs. Um, Tonalist, uh, to me, I want to bet him. I've wanted to bet him for three months. I wanted to bet him in the wood. And now then he had to go run in that sloppy track, and I just hate that. Every horse that I've ever watched win in the slop, they lose their next race. And it's like the kiss of death. It, uh, I don't know what it is. If, in, in some ways, it, it kind of makes me wonder if, if track shouldn't be sloppy, because it seems like a lot of... Everybody goes and scratches out of these sloppy races, but it seems like you see a lot of big-time winning performances in some of these sloppy races. So, I mean, he just looks like a router. He's got legitimate Pleasant Colony breeding. who's one of the only two or three sire lines left that brings some really some 12 furlong distance into the game. What about a horse like Commissioner? You know, that horse has been slow all through the spring, but he is one of the few horses with a pedigree. And, you know, I kind of like the way he just kind of plotted along in the Peter Pan. And is he a horse if the fractions were slow and he's a little bit closer than expected? Or he just doesn't have – because he did weigh a long time ago out game top billing when, when top billing was going good. Commissioner, yeah, I mean, I could kind of go either way on him. I, I did like him earlier in the year when he beat top billing. I thought that that was a pretty nice race. And – since then, he's just been so slow, and he just, like you said, he kind of plods along um, in there. And, you know, he has, it's kind of hard to make because he has the pedigree. He's by PND out of a touchable mare. I mean, you look at that and you think, well, if anyone's bred to run this far, it's him. But I almost think the pace here hurts him. Uh, the fact that, you know, I think they're going to go slow. He doesn't have a, a big kick or anything by any means. and. So I think that a slow pace does him no favors. I think he would have been much better off if there was some kind of a dual up front or some kind of a pace. Cl I think he needs when he wins a race. I think it's going to be a race where, you know, there is a ton of speed in there, and there's just ultimately a pace collapse that he's able to take advantage of, and that's just not going to be the case here. And as far as what you said with the, some of the others, I I, I completely agree with Bright on Curlin being up against it from the distance perspective. And I tweeted about it a couple days ago. Um, because I keep seeing people saying that right on Curlin is perfect for this distance, and they're kind of equating him with Palace Malice. 
which I don't understand in the slightest. Their pedigrees are completely different. On the, I mean, they're both by Curlin, sure, but the bottoms of their pedigrees are completely different. Pal Smells was, you know, all distance. I think his dam had, you know, one over like a mile and a quarter, and his dam tower one over a mile and a half. So I mean, he had tons and tons of, you know, distance in his, the bottom half of his pedigree. Whereas Brad and Curlin, of course, is out of a storm cat mare, and a lot of sprinters down there. And in the Preakness, I thought he looked very, very tired. Um, at the end. So, you know, I'll be interested even just to see how he runs here if he bounces back out of that race. Okay. You know, it is supposed to be roughly upper 70s, possibly 80 degrees on Saturday, and the Belmont is run late in the day. So the horses will be sitting around all day, and I do think that could come into play. I've, I've seen heat come into play a couple of times. I remember one of the years when this was back pre Lasix, but I remember Bet Twice really. I mean, he, he produced a, just a corker race and, and won by 13 lengths. There are strange results in the Belmont. So I did want to talk about California Chrome just because we didn't really mention him, just because the odds dictate we can't bet him. But I do think he is almost a little underappreciated. Uh, in the world of psychoanalysis, a lot of times everybody wants to rank everybody before their careers are over. And I've been following for 20 years, and the, you know the number of horses that have won six races in a row and the number of horses that have dominated for four races in a row are few and far between. And and I'm of the opinion it's like, like I just don't think people are appreciating how good he, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's been bad crops before. There's been good crops before. And Chrome has just dominated this crop. I mean, he, he just has. He's been the best horse in the race. Like last year after the Derby, a lot of people didn't really feel like Orb was the best horse. Last year in the Travers, people didn't feel like the winner was the best horse. Some people felt like uh, Mucho Macho Man wasn't the best horse in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but I can't find one person in the last six races who truly doesn't believe that Chrome was the best horse, and that's just unusual. Like, in this day and age, with trips and pace figures, and, like, he just dominates everywhere in the scorebook. Um, so I just think that he should be appreciated for the six straight wins. He's going to run a good race. He's going to lead going into the turn. And if he runs second or third, or if he wins, I guess my opinion doesn't really change. Like, to me, if he wins by five, I'm not going to think he's any better of a horse. And if he runs third by two lengths, I ain't going to think anything different either. It's like I just think he's the best horse, and I've seen the best horse lose many times in races like this. What about you? Do, uh, do you, I mean... Once it's inevitable and, and they're going into the starting gate, you've already got your bets in. At that point, you can't cancel them. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it mean anything if, if a triple crown's on the line? If he's winning by seven, like, do you soak it in, or do you just go, you're always just watching, you know, you'll be mad because you've got a little bit of money. <laughs> I won't be mad. I think this is going to be a fun race because I almost feel like, I mean, well, okay, I won't say it's win-win, because I, I lose if Chrome loses, and the horses I pick lose if somebody else wants at a big price, then maybe I'll be a little mad. But if Chrome is the reason that I don't, you know, make money on this race, I'll have no problem with that. I mean, I've kind of talked with you a little bit how, I mean, I'm not very old, I'm 24 years old, and I've seen eight horses who have won the first two legs and have lost it in the Belmont. So, you know, to see, you know, a horse win the Triple Crown would be really nice and would be a big deal. And, you know, that's one of those things I think we almost don't know if we'll ever see that again in our lifetime. So kind of have to relish it if it happens. Um, California Chrome, though, you know, I think some people tend to think that I'm a hater because I never pick him, but I just don't pick him because his odds haven't been any good for a long time. But uh, a horse like him, you know, I have so much respect for him because, you know, he's humbled me on so many occasions. I've never picked him, ever. And obviously he's won many a race in a row. Many, most of them, that, you know, we've covered them on here, and I've never picked him. And, you know, he just wins every single time. And I just have never seen a horse like him with the acceleration he has that can still, you know, win these, you know, longer routes. And so, you know, we'll just see what he does. I think for me, a triple crown isn't something that, like, I'm hoping for or wishing for because I just think if he's good enough, then he'll win it. And if he's not, then he won't, and that's okay. And we'll move on to next year. And, you know, I just, you know, I have faith that somebody in my lifetime will do it. So, 
you know, that the horse is good enough to do it. And, you know, me sitting here hoping and wishing for them isn't going to change anything by any means. So, you know, I won't have him, but if he's the reason that I don't win, that's, that's okay. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing for me. I I haven't picked him in any of these six races. I would say that I thought he was going to win five of them, but the other one, I actually, I mean, way back to the San Felipe, I actually kind of didn't know if he was going to win or not. But the last five, he was just unbettable from a, a picking standpoint. Um, but I'm a firm believer, you know, it's kind of the same thing in, in NBA basketball. It's like, I don't really care if the Heat win three titles in a row, and I, whether they do or don't, they're still a good team, and it's kind of the same thing with Chrome. It's like, I don't need to rank, I just, I enjoy the moment. I like the Derby, I like the Preakness, I like the Belmont, and I really don't care if there's ever a Triple Crown winner. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, to me, there are three races, there are three separate races, there are three big days, you get excited for them, but I... You know, my life isn't going to be complete if California Chrome wins on Saturday, and it, it isn't any more devastated if he loses on Saturday. So, I guess I'm a racing fan, but I'm I, I like each of the in races individually, and I think each of the three races are challenges. And if a horse happens to win all three, well, then that's just kind of the way it goes. So, if Chrome wins, I think it's a great deal, but I I'll open up the racing form on Sunday and dive into another race. So it just kind of, life moves on. And I mean, that, and that's one of the problems with horse racing is there really is no season. You know, like right. in baseball, that would be the World Series or the Super Bowl. Like, it just seems like if, if this was really a big deal, like you would never, you wouldn't see a horse race for like a month and everybody would just soak in California Chrome. And that's probably one of the problems with people getting fans of horse racing. Yeah, and I think one thing, too, is, you know, sometimes people, are, like, they're so eager to rank, and they're looking into this race and saying, who is the best of this real crop? And, you know, we kind of see that every year. And, you know, I think, I hope that last year, if anything, taught us that, like, there maybe isn't necessarily the best, that, you know, several of these horses are good in their own element, in their own distance, at their own types of races. I mean, people made such a big deal last year about after Orb won the Derby saying, well, this is a terrible three-year-old crop. None of these guys are any good. And then, you know, we had Olympic Charge almost won the Classic. We had Golden Suns win the Dirt Mile. And now we've got Palace Malice come on this year. So, you know, if California Chrome wins, you know, if you think he's the best, then great. But we might see some of these guys go into, you know, go to move to the turf or move into races that are more, you know, their element distance-wise. And they might kind of find their own, too. So, you know, don't be so eager to knock on everyone else as well. The one horse I would be surprised is if Matuzak goes on to become a, a grade one winner. I'll, I'll give you the rest of the field, but if Matuzak develops into a Travers winner, then I, I think I You're will retiring. say... You're uh, retiring. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm admitting defeat. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm looking forward to the big day. I know you're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to be watching all the races, and it uh, looks like nice weather, and there's some funky uh, two-day bets again, and then there's going to be yeah. big... Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a great two days of racing, and next week we'll recap the Belmont. We'll talk about the either the Triple Crown winner or the near miss, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll probably we we'll probably will talk about a couple of these other big races as well, just because Beholder is quite the matchup with uh, Close Hatches and Princess of Silmar, and the Met Mile really is a, a proving ground for four or five horses. Um, unless Broadway Empire wins that one, then we won't discuss that race either. So, uh, uh, anything that you're one horse that you I know Grandeur is kind of your 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 baby for the day. Yeah, yeah, Grandeur is my my favorite horse in the world, and like I said, I do think this is kind of the perfect setup. So if he can't win there, I'm really disappointed unless like he has a major trip to Kilis or something. Um, but that that's a really interesting race too, because I do think a few of those horses, I would, you know, I know Grand Prix Real Solution, I would think, and a couple others um, are probably heading to the Arlington Million next too. So it's going to be interesting to see how they perform there on the way to that. I did want to say, though, since you mentioned the the funky two day devil, the the Gold Cup, the two mile race, uh, and then that goes into the Belmont Stakes. Um, I won't go in depth here, but I will say there's two ladies in the two mile race. Um, a Canadian bread and an Irish bread. And I say pay attention to both of those. And I'll discuss it on my blog, but but keep an eye on the girls in the, the long race. 
All right. I, I think maybe you're feeling confident because you went out for a jog the other day, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So that's going to do it. Uh, we have looked forward to capping and recapping this next week. That's going to do it for another edition of Down to the Wire.